Good, we're going to start, guys. Um, so, Yehuda Levi, the poets for today. Um, so, as, uh, as it says on the top line, that he was especially, and, and still, actually, even after his lifetime, uh, celebrated for his poetry. Because uh, we spoke about uh, the Kuzari, right? His, his thoughts, his philosophy last uh, class. And um, that... Uh, has become popular again, but uh, the the poetry is his poetry always been um, getting interest because it's part of the of the liturgy, some of it, right? But during his lifetime, it's not just uh, uh, liturg liturgical poetry, but all kinds of poetry. Actually, we spoke about an illusion poetry whole class, and the whole thing was that we saw that uh, this Arabic meter was adopted, and there's all this kind of, of genres in Arabic poetry. But in the beginning, it was not seen as something uh, suitable for liturgy. Uh, it's um, actually, it's also because liturgy was kind of fixed already. But, the, but Ibn Gabirol was the first one to, um, to write litur uh, poetry for liturgy. So his poetry was entered into the service. And then other people started doing that too. I mean, the first one to do that with uh, Arabic meter, with what we call Andalusian poetry. Uh, we know that Abitur, he wrote poetry for liturgy, but that was pre, that, like the old style. Okay. Now, Yudha Levi uh, is also uh, quite big on both. But as I said, he was very, as I, as I had explained before, um, liturgy, oh no, not liturgy, poetry was so celebrated, if you could say things in beautiful language, you were like the man, right? You were like, wow, this is, everybody was into poetry. So it's so cool that um, he, he, he was, he was uh, venerated because of his uh, command of the words and the language. And, and if you really delve into it and you know uh, Hebrew, and you know, and you understand these uh, how these syllables work and, and everything, and you know grammar well, then uh, for sure it's really something very special what he does with language. Um, yeah, so let's go to Kevin. Not here. Me. Oh, Kevin, you're here. Very nice, Kevin. Good, uh, Kevin. Um, I wrote, I read the first line already, so you can go to the next line. As a young man, Yehuda did not seem to have been very serious about religion. Instead, he preferred to drink wine and have careless fun. Even then, he produced amazing poems with seemingly effortless ease. On occasion, he even paid for his drinks with the poem. Yeah, the, the very first uh, uh, poem that we have by him is, uh, is, is exactly that. Here's... Uh, he was in a cafe or in a wine uh, place drinking wine, and there was somebody who said, give this guy a jar for me. It's my treat. Because uh, maybe they liked him, maybe they knew he was, uh, maybe they liked his poetry or whatever, I don't know. And he wrote a poem right there and, and gave it as a, as, a, as a counter gift to the people who offered him wine. And um, so there's a number of drinking poems that he wrote. I have one here. Um, so the, the, the earliest one we know. So, do you want to read this one? Yeah. I shall sing your praise all my days for the nectar you sent for my lips. Brother, brother Joel joins in my lays, and from him I won't seize my lips. My sip. Even though all my friends, my sip. Even though all my friends say, come, come, how much longer will you play the rake? What I, re I have gleed balm and Sean, during yeah, to it's, cure it's, every it's every tough. day. It's stuff. Sorry, I shan't. So There's an old word for shall not. I uh, won't. I shan't drink to cure every ache. Right. I'm too young to put down the cup. I've only begun to pick up and pour. What end should I stop when my ears have not reached twenty four? Right. So it's a nice rhyme in English. It's always nice when it rhymes in English too, so you have an idea about it. But in, in Hebrew, of course, the rhyme is very different. Um, so as you see that um, even secular poetry, um, you know what the difference is with Arabic and Hebrew? This is very interesting. Arabic, of course, 
is a, a, was a, ling, a living language. But to some extent, and I don't want to say that derogatorily, Hebrew was a <clears throat> Hebrew was a dead language. I mean, nobody's really people didn't speak it to each other. The only time that people actually spoke it to each other uh, is when people met from different countries and they don't know their, each other's native language, and then because then they would speak Hebrew because you'd learn Hebrew in school, but as as I said, as a dead language, as a language of liter uh, of of literature and of study. Oh, the, the language of the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, uh, um, rabbinic uh, literature, or, um, lit, uh, or the, lit, or the litur liturgy, you know, the, the, the prayers. But people really studied the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, really well, much more than people generally do now. So the Sephardi uh, culture, even um, the students and the, and the academies, would study much less. Talmud, but much more Bible. That has been until actually today or yesterday, uh, generally the, the case in Sephardi culture. So people really knew their Bible well. They knew the phrases by heart. And so when they write uh, poetry, it's not that they say, oh, I, have, I know, a, like, like Arabs might do, oh, I know a, uh, a, a saying or a word that my grandfather used to use because in Hebrew, grandfathers they didn't speak to your grandfather in Hebrew, right? So you would say, oh, I know a phrase from that part of the Bible. Ah, and that works and this works. That's, that's why you get your inspiration. So the Hebrew poetry is full of references uh, from the Bible. So, uh, and I can't even, we have to really delve into deep to bring up a lot. But um, so, so almost all the words are, are biblical anyway. Now, even though, let's go to the, the middle uh, um, stanza, because um, even though all my friends say, come, come, how much longer will you play the rake? Now, I looked up what rake is. It's an English word, but it's not something that I hear on the street or every day. But I think it has to do with drinking. I forgot already. I'm so sorry, because uh, I looked it up a year ago. and. In the meantime, I forgot, but that's fine. It's not so important, but now there comes uh, the next line, a reference to, um, to uh, a reference to, um, sorry, to, to a biblical uh, expression. What I'll reply, I have Gilead's balm. Now, Gilead uh, is, a, is an area in the Bible and they had balm that would, that would heal your, your, your ill. Uh, and I think, um, and, and this has to do, he's saying that, that, uh, that the wine is killing all his ache. It's, it's killing his, uh, his depression. It's killing his, uh, he feels down maybe, or maybe whatever. So, and he, even though he's, he's young, he still needs that. But um, that is, that's a, a, a reference to, to um, a biblical expression. And chandering to cure every ache. Okay, now the next. I'm too young to put down the cup. The cup in Hebrew has two letters, you see, uh, and it's pronounced kads. It's the letter kaf and the letter dalet. I've only begun to pick up and pour. What end should I stop when my years are not reached uh, 24? So we know he's 23 years old. And 24, if you abbreviate that in, uh, you can write the word 24 in Hebrew, but you can also use numbers. So uh, let's say in, I hope most of us, will understand uh, Roman uh, numerals. Uh, one is, a, is an I and five is a V and X is 10 and, uh, and C is 100. But you have something similar in Hebrew. So the first letter is uh, the Kaf is 20 and the Dalet is four. So you write the 24 exactly the same in this way as the word Kaf. And therefore, it's not only, it's really cool, it's not only a rhyme, but it's also a wordplay. Cop means 24. Okay. Very nice. Kevin, we'll do one more, uh, we'll do a little more. Now, uh, the, he also wrote riddles. Here's one riddle, and we'll look, uh, and we'll think about if we understand the riddle. Would you like to do it? Yeah. What is, what is it that, that's blind with an eye in its head, but the race of mankind? Its use cannot spare. Spends all its life in clothing the dead, always 
itself is naked and bare. Well, do you have any idea what this is? Absolutely no clue. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know anything that uh, has an eye in its head? One eye? In the race. No? Anyone? Yeah. No one. Okay, here we go. Is it a needle? Yeah, <laughs> did you see that on the screen or no? No. Very good. Who says this? Rachel. Oh, hi, Rachel. Very good. It's very good. So, yeah, it's blind. You cannot see. It has an eye in its head because it's the eye of the needle, right? Um, the race of mankind, can, it, its use cannot spare. We cannot uh, live. We need clothing, so we cannot spare it. Uh, it spends all its life in clothing the dead. I get the living too, but uh, it also makes uh, shrouds for the dead. And, but, it's, uh, but always itself, it's naked and bare. That's very good. We'll go to uh, the next. Okay. Next. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. And as we have Rachel, maybe Rachel, you want to read one? Sure. What's thrown on the ground where it dies and is buried naked with dung, then comes to life where it lies and gives birth to fully clothed young. Ooh, that's a thinker. Anyone has an idea? A little easier, I think. I found it. But... No? I will reveal the answer. Grain. It's thrown on the ground where it dies. It decomposes, right? It's, uh, easy. At least uh, it looks like it. And it's buried naked with dung. It's naked. It doesn't have any clothing. I mean, because it's uh, um, normal. But then it comes to life where it lies and gives birth to fully clothed young. So the young, they have these husks, right? So that's, they're clothed. Ah, okay. So those are two riddles. Now, this, is, this one is a puzzle for me. I've, I've uh, not this year, the previous years, I worked on this very one because it looked like a very cute little poem. And then I got, then it became a puzzle and I will explain to you why. Now, let's first look at the, at the, um, are there people waiting? No, let's look at the, at the Hebrew because this is an Arabic meter. As, as you see on the bottom, long, long, short, long, long, long. Short, long, long, long. Yom sha'a sha'tihu ale birkai, wa yart munato be ishonai, nashak shite ainai metatea, etsta oro nashak velo ainai. All right. It's cute, it's short, and it means, Rachel? I mean, sorry, it's a, uh, you don't know what it means. But according to this translator, this her, this uh, Mr. or Mrs. Masik, um, I found this online. It was the first translation I found. He kissed me, and this is what he says it means. Mm -hmm. When upon my knees I dang dandled him, and my pupils he saw his image. He kissed my two eyes cheekily. His visage did he kiss, and not my eyes. Yeah, so it doesn't rhyme. He didn't really try to make it into rhyme. Uh, do you know what dandling is? I thought it was like dangle. But what is dangle? I don't know what dangling is. Uh, it's like swinging loosely, but this is probably like sitting or placing on. Yeah, yeah. When the little child is on your knee and you hop, 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 you know, that is supposedly dandling. Uh, this do you do with children. So what's happening here in this, uh, in this poem? Um, he has a kid on his lap mm -hmm. and the kid is kissing um, the man's eyes, but like not because he wants to kiss the man, but because he wants to kiss his own reflection. Yeah. A bit weird for children, maybe, but um, that's what it, what, what it says. So it's dandling. Yeah. Because of the word dandling, then it's, it definitely sounds like a, ch a child. Um, I thought it wasn't really uh, a nice translation. So I, my first step was I made my own translation and I made this translation. You want to read this? The day I let him ride my knee, he saw his image in my eyes. He kissed both eyes, but via me, he smooched his reflection in disguise. At least it rhymes uh, and it uh, has a meter. So, um, but, that, but then I looked further and what did I find? I found a translation by Emma Lazarus. Does, do you know what, who Emma Lazarus was? 
No? Does you anyone know? Like, um, like uh, the women's movement to, to learn, so, so women learn more Torah or something? So I can't hear you, sorry. sorry. Isn't, she, isn't she part of the movement to have women um, learn the, the books of Judaism, like the Torah and, and Gemara? I don't know about that. She oh. was uh, she was actually a member of my congregation, Charity Israel, but uh, she was not uh, very religious. Uh, but um, so that's why I doubt it. She was a, a famous uh, poet, and uh, she wrote the words on that are inscribed on the Statue of Liberty: "Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempestos, to me." I lift my lamp beside the golden door. People are, are, are in favor of uh, more liberal immigration will usually, usually will very often um, cite, uh, recite this, uh, this, this part of the poem. It's a much longer poem, it's called The New Colossus. So it was written for, at the, for the inauguration of this. Uh, of this. But um, later she became more interested when there were a lot of uh, 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 refugees from Eastern Europe because of pogroms. She became uh, involved more in Judaism and in helping Jews, and she started uh, becoming interested in uh, Jewish literature and in Jewish uh, uh, Ju and Judaism. But I don't know uh, that that part. I don't know. So, okay, but we'll continue. She wrote an also uh, a translation on the same poem, even though she doesn't didn't know Hebrew. So that was a bit of a puzzle for me. But here is here here it is. Rachel, you go. Into my eyes, he lovingly looked. My arms about his neck were twined. And in the mirror of my eyes, what but his image did he find? Upon my dark-hued eyes, he pressed his lip with breath of passion rare. The rogue, t'was not my eye. He kissed his picture mirrored there. So there's a big difference between the first uh, interpretation and this one, isn't there? I mean, the image gives it away already. Mm-hmm. What do you, what, what's the big difference? Um, this is about a lover, not about a child. Exactly. So um, this is what we, this would be uh, what, we, what we spoke about, a theme, one of the themes in uh, Andalusian uh, poetry that you had is called um, homoerotic poetry, right? Now, the que my question was, uh, how did she, where did she get this from? How did she, because in Hebrew, uh, in Hebrew, let's go back to the Hebrew, I uh, hear, right? Sha'ashatihu, yom sha'ashatihu. He, he uh, this Masi translated as, I dandled him. What is, that's not a very common word, right? Sha'ashatihu, le sha'ashaya. Who knows what that means? Could be anything. So, how does she, how does she, um, it doesn't even say on my knees here, does it? No, she, 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 uh, she it's puzzling because uh, she left out the whole knee part. Um, okay, but so where did she get it from? I found <laughs> the following. I found a, uh, uh, somebody who had translated into German. And uh, this person, uh, does anyone know German? Oh, yeah. In any case, probably not. Lieder der Liebe. This means this means. Uh, uh, so this and it's also in um, Gothic letters. So it's a little hard to read anyway. But uh, songs of love. Er sah mir liebend in die Augen und ich hielt uh, kosend ihn umfangen und in dem Spiegel meiner Augen sah er sein Eigenbild gefangen. That's in German. So um, he saw me lovingly in the eyes and. Um, I held him uh, caressingly uh, embraced. And in the mirror of my eyes, he saw his own image captured there. there he kissed me, my dark eyes and kissed, kissed them so hot and wild. The rogue, he kissed not his, the, his eyes, but he kissed his own image. So it's exactly, he also leaves out the, the knee part, uh, uh, which are, is in Hebrew. And it's exactly this, this Hebrew, this, ex, this English is exactly the reflection of this German. Now we know that uh, Emma Lazar, she did uh, know German, she knew French, she knew uh, maybe even Italian, I'm not sure. And she has, uh, she translated uh, famous 
poems in German into English. She did that and made them into beautiful English poetry. So she, and I found out that she had access to, uh, to this, to this. By the way, this is not, this translator was not a poet at all. He was actually a gynecologist, <laughs> but he, uh, uh, poetry was his hobby. So it was really cool. Uh, so this little piece of the puzzle, I still was not 100% convinced. Um, then I found out that Halevi had taken, had, had translated the Hebrew and changed it a bit from Arabic. And this is an Arabic poem by a, a famous uh, poem called Al Mutanabbi. And Al Mutanabbi lived uh, a little over 100 years before him. And so this is the, my English translation of the Arabic, uh, Rachel. Twas when we were alone and free that in my eyes she saw her own reflection. She kissed my eyes but cheated me and kissed her own mouth with affection. It's exactly the same thing. The only thing is this is a woman and not a man. Um, uh, in, in, he, in Arabic it's quite a simple poem. In Hebrew it's actually uh, a bit more, uh, in, uh, more interesting uh, linguistically. Uh, but he used it and uh, so the question, so this is, seems to me that that's moved. So then I made another uh, translation based on the Hebrew. And this would be the, I think, what, what the Hebrew, because I came to the conclusion, because it is not about an innocent child, it is about, uh, about uh, something erotic. And because he talks about a he and not about a she. Uh, so I have to uh, admit that this was part of the uh, homoerotic poetry. Although, of course, the question is, was he involved in this in, in reality, or was it just because it was a, a, a genre and he wanted to cover that genre? We will never know, it will be guessing. Um, but uh, here we go, this is my translation of his Hebrew based on the knowledge that I, I had uh, gathered. Yes. The day I fondled him on my knee, he lustfully looked into my eyes. When cunningly he kissed both these, he embraced his image in disgust. Yeah, there we go. So this, this would be it. I don't know. I don't know if it's interesting, but um, how poetry could be like a bit of a still uh, finding out uh, what the meaning is and stuff. A bit of a Sherlock Holmes kind of a story. This, that's research. Okay, let's go to the next. Um, We'll do one more. This is um, a funny one, anyway. One silver, one silver hair appeared upon my head. I plucked it with my hand, and then it said, "You beat me this time, but while I am one, but one, what can you do when all my friends will come?" Yeah. So one hair, you think, "Oh, pick it out," and then eventually, there's no stopping it. And here is George Clooney. Okay, after being great, and before, so. Now, uh, we'll go to some poems of religious devotion. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to, um, is Natalie there? Hi, I'm here. Hey, Natalie, thank you. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you doing? Very good. Now, got to say something. It might come up uh, later too, but um, many people uh, who talk about uh, Yuda Levy's poetry say that, uh, when he was young, he, um, he embraced Arabic uh, meter, but then later he said, no, that is, uh, that's not Hebrew, that's not uh, authentic. We shouldn't imitate the other uh, the poetry of the other nations. We should um, have our own. And so this, this, this Andalusian poetry with these long and short syllables, that's just uh, not, so that he abandoned that and, and, and went back to, uh, an old, more old-fashioned style in some ways of poetry, but um, after became religious, basically. But um, I find a lot of uh, uh, some poetry that are still religious, and even in the end of his life, I still find poetry, if you look carefully and you look at all the syllables, some of the poetry still has Arabic meter. So, um, so he might not have done it exclusively, but he still didn't totally, it's not really true that he totally abandoned uh, Andalusian uh, meter. Now, this one is an example that is done in Andalusian meter. So once again, I did the short syllables in red. So it's long, long, short, long, 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 short, long, 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 long. Um, hold on, I have to move this a bit. Yeah, so are you, are you up to uh, reading the Hebrew or not really? Just for the sound of it? 
Um, I, I guess I can. If you want. Okay. Uh, I hope I'm not too bad. I haven't read in a while, but I can try. You can try and try to do the, the syllables, basically. Yeah. Okay. Likirat makor chayei, chayei, hamet haruta, alchen v'chayei shiva v'erik akuta, l'erod penei malki migmati leved, Gamati Lavad, right? Lavad, Lo Arot, Bilto, Velo Ayurza, Mi Eat Nini, Mi Eat Nini, yeah. So it's okay, but we get an idea. That's really cool. It's, we don't have to do the whole thing. But if you if you uh, if you uh, pronounce everything correctly, then it is um, uh, you have you hear long long short like Li Krat M. Now, what's all, what I see um, a lot is that the the, the end rhyme. So yeah, um, this doesn't the halves doesn't don't rhyme, but the first it's only the end of the line that rhymes, right? So, um, but the first line the half also rhymes. You see that a lot. In any case, why am I spending so much time on this? Read the English, please. <laughs> Sorry. Oh gosh. Yeah. For the fountain of true life I race, this life of emptiness and vanity I spurn, I spurn. My only goal is to see my, my master's face. None other do I fear, for no one else I yearn. If only I could see him in a dream, I'd sleep forever, care not if I die. If I, if not, care not if I died. If I could see his face within my heart, my eyes would never turn their gaze outside. It goes well. So the fountain of true life, that's God, right? Um, this life of emptiness and vanity, I spurn. So um, he's, he's sick and tired of this life because it seems so shallow. Uh, sometimes could be. That is sometimes true. Depends how you look at life. But um, you would think that the fountain of true life, if you, uh, if you have the fountain of true life, that you would also see meaning in this life. Uh, that it's not all emptiness and vanity. But okay. So it's this dichotomy between this life is, is it's all about the outside and it's all and so much, so much emptiness and so much lies and uh, I would like to uh, be connected to uh, to true values and to 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 God who is outside of this world I guess my only goal is to see my master's face so he's this is almost like um, the themes are very much as in Islamic mysticism in Sufism to uh, to see my master's face. No other do I fear, for no one else I yearn. So it's really, this is expression of yearning for God to see his face. Now, of course, you cannot see his face. So then he thinks, well, maybe in a dream. If only I could see him in a dream, I'd sleep forever. He wouldn't even want to wake up anymore. He would just want to sleep and just die and be one with God. And if I could see his face in my heart, I would never want to look, open my eyes anymore. I wouldn't look outside anymore. Um, so. Uh, this might not be a, a good poem as your motto of your life because you want to function in life, right? And this is, uh, this is interesting because, uh, because of Andalusian, Spanish, uh, whatever, Islam, uh, under, uh, under Islamic uh, living um, rabbis, were very much into this life too. And, and also, you yeah, know, he too. He wrote poetry, poetry of wine and, of, and, and love poetry and stuff. But um, then all of a sudden there's this, it's, it seems like maybe because Yehuda Halevi was not always so religious, then when he became religious, he goes extreme. He like doesn't like this world as it is anymore. He wants uh, a utopia, just a spiritual bliss constantly and a living in the, and we already saw that he thinks, uh, the, the Yud Halevi uh, in the, in the Kuzari, that uh, the, the land of Israel is where you really can connect to God. So then he has this yearning for Israel and he even wants to, he's even ready to give up his family just to go to Israel to be closer to God. And we saw how that worked out. Uh, maybe read this one. This is, um, this is pretty, very pretty. Morning praise. To you the stars of, of morning sing because your lights from your light spring. Like them, the angels on their watches, both night and day, extol their king. 
Your holy people join with them. Each dawn their songs from, from your house ring. Yeah, so we have the stars in the morning. Stars supposedly praise God by their lights. By the way, people in those days still didn't know what the stars were. They didn't know there were suns. They, uh, there was a lot of people who thought that stars were actually spiritual beings uh, on the firmament or that they were angels um, or like angels or a certain type of angels. So um, then it's not so strange that the stars are here parallel with angels. Like angels on their watches both nights and they extol their king. They, they praise God. So the stars praise God. The angels praise God. So there's, there's three, right? The first two lines is about uh, the stars. The second two lines is, is about angels. And the third two lines is about the Jewish people. They also praise God in the morning uh, when, they, when they do their morning prayers. So this, that's very pretty. It's very, uh, it's very cool. Um, what else did I want to say? Ah, and look, I actually, coincidentally, when I made this into a rhyme, um, I actually did the same thing. Look, so, uh, wait, so the, these are, it's actually, it's actually three, uh, three lines. So that it's, these are double lines. So this is one line. This is another line. This is another line. Here we go. This is the, the rhyme. Spring, king, and ring. But halfway, so the halfway doesn't rhyme them and watches. But the first time it, it rhymes halfway too, just like in the Hebrew. See that? So that's cool. I did that. Wow. <laughs> Funny. That's, uh, this, this, is, uh, nah, this is also uh, religiously um, uh, inspired when we do this one too. Slaves of time are slaves of slaves. Alone who serves the Lord is free. Each soul shall get what it most craves. My soul, let God your portion be. Yeah. So if you constantly serve time, like, oh, on the clock, oh, and I have to do this, oh, I have to do that, and uh, you're rushed and rushed. This is, it's almost like he's talking about modern life in Manhattan, but even though this was medieval uh, Granada, but I guess they had uh, a bit of the same, same uh, problem. Now, now we have liturgical poetry. And um, this is really cool. Uh, this is, I mean, cool, yeah. I, I think it's special. Uh, this is read uh, in, in Sephardic congregation on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And you see these Hebrew letters, left and right of the picture. This picture is just because it's a, a supplication, right? It's, uh, Lord, this day, this day I supplicate, oh, hear my prayer and plead, oh, Lord. So this is, uh, whatever, it's just like supplicate, supplication. But the letters, are the four letters of the name of God that we do not pronounce. So on the right is a, the small letter is a Yod. The, the second one from the right is the letter He. Then the Vav and then the He. Okay, so that means it's usually translated as Lord. Some people translate it, uh, uh, it's pronounced in prayer as Adonai. Some people say Hashem, to be more careful even, which just only means the name. So Lord, so this is just the first line. And you see, it starts and ends with Lord. Now, this poetry, this poem, has um, every word, every line, starts and ends with Lord, with Adonai in Hebrew. So let's go to the first one. Look, this is centered around the letter He, uh, Yud, the first letter. And here's the, it says here Yud, so you know what it is. And you see here, Lord, 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 Lord. It ends and with Lord. Now, that's, of course, that would be too easy for a rhyme. The word Lord is not the rhyme. It is actually, the rhyme is in, inside here. So it's a really uh, intricate rhyme. But you see that this, this letter, um, on the sides, these two squibbles here, and the end and the beginning, that is how you, how you can sometimes write Adonai or Lord. So that is this. But you see in the inner part, which is also divided in two, the first letter and the last letter is, a, is the same letter. So the center, central theme of this um, stanza, every sentence starts and begins not only with Lord, but also starts and begins with the first letter of Lord. Now, as I said before, letters in Hebrew have numerical values. So like, like the C is, a, is 10 in, 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 in Roman, uh, in, La, in Latin uh, system. This letter stands for 10. And interestingly enough, this uh, stanza has 10 lines. See, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, ten. 
So it's 10 lines that ha have the, 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 the series of Lord. So it's all about supplication. I can, uh, this is a tune to this. I, um, we sing it in this tune. Adonai yom lecha eroch techina she'ai koli v'shau ati Adonai Adonai adhar el ghalei Geburat chava honneni Adonai etc. Um, so the whole, the whole thing. Um, maybe I should continue, continue to the next. Because now you already guess. If this is the first letter, then the second strophe is going to be this letter He. This letter He has numerical value five. And yet, this is He. It starts, every line starts with a He and ends with a He. And, um, and it has five lines because it is the letter He is number five. Adonai hein beyadecha machshevotai besod libi lecha nigleh Adonai. It rhymes, right? Nigleh, ureh, odeh, tifdeh. The next one is the third letter of the divine name, which is the letter Vav, Wow, or Wav, or Vav. It's originally Wow, and then, but uh, in uh, in many countries, let's say in um, in Spain. They didn't have the w, and in Germany they didn't have the w. So uh, in Germany they have the v. So then it becomes vav, vav. Uh, actually, they don't have the w. They have the v. But it's very close to v. So v, vav. Uh, they can't say v either, but v. So um, uh, in any case, there's some people still say w. Yemenite will pronounce it as w. Yemenite Jews. But in any case, that that's not so important. You see. Every line begins and starts. I put it in blue to make it clear with the letter wow. And, um, and because this has numerical value six, it has six lines. My God, in thee I hope and pray that my. And it's also interesting that the translator, this is not me, made everything rhyme too. So, for instance, here everything ends with, "Hear my prayer and pre and plea, thy might with clarity." Um, oh, I have this probably. I re and may uh, for good may I remember to be. Thy grace shall comfort me. What help have I but thee? My sin, O oh, do not see. It's really, it's really nice. In my soul, in misery, my prayer urgently. Here, this one. Since in thy hands are all that my thoughts, my depth, thy wisdom knows. Like thou on me, look thou on me with open eyes, heal my pain and woes. And so it reminds you to the last one is again this, uh, the same letter as the second one, the set letter hey, it begins and ends with the same letter and it has the same meter and, um, and it has five lines because it is number five. Now, enough about this one, I think. Yashima, that is read on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. I only have two, uh, a few lines, but um, it's, it has a beautiful tune. So um, that would be, uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I said this, uh, I included this. And we'll listen to three different tunes. In any case, um, Amy, is Amy here? I'm here. Amy, hello. Hi. Hello. Would you like to just read these a uh, few lines? Yeah, sure. Lord, listen to your poor people who seek your presence. Our Father, do not turn your ear from your children. And then, Lord, out of the depths of your people, cry out in bitter distress. Turn them not back from before you, empty of, his, of favor this day. Uh, this is a day of supplication, a day of asking for forgiveness. And so, um, you would, and it sounds pretty desperate, right? Bitter distress, out of the depth. But these are uh, reference to biblical uh, texts. Um, Turn not your back from them. It's like even that uh, father that turns their back on his children. It's just a horrible image. On the other hand, you would think it would be a tune like this. Oh, please. But it's not. It's a very upbeat <laughs> tune, actually. Now, I found um, a recording. It is in style, a medieval style. I don't know. People might have found them because even in the Middle Ages, they wrote music. And not as uh, the system was a bit different. But Gregorian music and stuff is, is written down. And we actually found 
even um, uh, some, very little, litur Jewish liturgical music written down with musical notes. So maybe they found it because it sounds, and this might be the original tune. I would not be surprised. So let's listen. I hope you can hear it. Keep this uh, melody in mind, and uh, I will now sing uh, the melody as it is um, sung in the tradition of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, also called the Western Sephardic Jews, and um, y it sounds very different. But if you have an ear for it, you might recognize that it is the same basic tune, just you know, in a different version. Uh, so. Um, Please uh, pay attention and um, judge for yourself. Yam shemang ebyonecha Am halim banecha Abinu lebanecha Al tanglem oznecha Ya namim mamakim Yikrebu merob mesukim Al natushi bemrekim Hayom milfa necha Ya shema epionecha Ham halim panecha Abinu leba necha Al tanglem um, if you recognize this is basically the same tune, just a lot more upbeat and, and faster and simplified. Now the third version is a um, what they call Mizrahi version, Oriental Jewish version. Well, it could be North African or Middle Eastern. Um, and if you, once again, if you have an ear for it, um, you will hear it's again basically the same tune but more simplified and more upbeat and uh, more easy to uh, see. But it has definitely an oriental, like an Arabic style flavor. So listen to that. Yeah, so it's the same tune. In any case, it's fun. I don't know. It's fun to... Uh... That actually sounds familiar to me. What? That actually sounds familiar to me, that tune. That you just now, now, the third time it uh, sounded familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's also used for other... Uh, if it's a very popular tune, then... Uh, um, who's, who's speaking, actually? I can't see. Marlene. Um, so, uh, you're uh, Syrian, right? Yeah. So in the Syrian community, I think if, if it's a certain... Uh, Makam, then they might even use it for other texts too, the same tune. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's cool. Um, okay, so um, uh, there's another uh, another genre that is very typical for Yehuda Levi. It's called Zionides. Those are love poems to describe Zion. As we said, and uh, we, we mentioned about the Kuzari, that he believed that the land of Israel, also called Zion, um, it has this special, has Safwa, remember the word Safwa? So it has uh, this special, um, 
special whatever action actual character that enables you to be closer to god and um and so the most uh, so he wrote started writing like homesick poetries homesickness to the land that he had never seen it's basically now it's not so strange that now in israel his uh his his book the kuzari is um very popular because it's basically like a proto-zionism but the spiritual zionism he never and this is important to know because I, there's usually a question on this in the exam. Um, he, he never uh, actually started um, going around and people join me on my trip to Israel, all going to go to Israel. That he never did. It was his personal journey. I think one person went with him, but stayed behind in Egypt. He went to, uh, to uh, eventually, I think he went all on his own. And that was, he, it was a personal journey. But the, the, the longing for Zion, for, for Zion, for the, the Holy Land, for the Promised Land, that is, that's a form of, well, it's, it has many parallels with Zionism, of course. Um, Amy, would you like to read these uh, bold letters? Yeah, sure. I was starting with initially, right? Okay, sure. Or no, where did you No, that's okay. Just, I, I don't know what, yeah, just start. Anyway. Okay. Initially, Halevi wrote his poems exclusively in the style of Dunash ibn Liberat, according to Arabic meter. Later, for a while, he rejected the style as being foreign to Hebrew, but picked it up again after a while. My heart is in the east is written in Arabic meter. Oh, I thought I had corrected this. I had changed this, but maybe it's somewhere else. Um, I thought that he, oh yeah, I picked it up again. For a while, he rejected it, in any case. Now, I, I, I separated here the... The syllable, so you can now actually see libidos along, and then b mizrach is short for those who know Hebrew. Also, you see that I had done the end rhyme. It all ends with rab 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 here, all in blue. But in the middle, it has the on the first line. It also has the same, the same uh, meter, um, the same rhyme. Now let's go to libib mizrach anochi besof ma'arav. Many people who, who uh, grew up in Jewish day schools. Um, uh, yeah, we will know this one, yeah. huh? We learned this in school. You learned this in Hebrew? Yeah, yeah, in uh, Hebrew literature class. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's very beautiful. So uh, here is uh, a Scheinlin, who's a scholar, wrote this. Um, he wrote this translation. And My heart is in the east. My heart is in the east, but the rest of me far in the west. How can I savor this life, even taste what I eat? How in the chains of the moor, Zion, Zion bound to the cross, can I do what I what I vowed to do, vowed to and must? Gladly I leave all the best of Grand Spain for one glimpse of Jerusalem's dust. Yeah, so there is a bit uh, must and dust rhymes, okay, um, but that's basically it. It's not uh, it doesn't have any 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 rhythmic meter to it. Now my heart is in the east. What's in the east? What do you think? And he's in the west. Where is he when he writes this? Are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, heart in the East, like maybe referring to the Holy Land. Yeah, and he is in the West. And where is that? Would that be Spain? Yeah, that would be Spain. Very good. Uh, how can I save this food? Even taste what I eat. So he doesn't like the life he is because he is homesick, right? When you're or love sick, you can't eat and drink. Uh, in the chains of the Moor, do you know what Moor? What the word Moor is? Um, yeah, I believe, aren't they like the, maybe like a tribe or like a tribe of Arabs or something that kind of lived in Spain? Yeah, very good. Actually, Moor is a, is a term for Berbers. And um, we know that uh, in his life, and we discussed it last class, the Almoravids came, that was a Berber tribe. So another word for Berber is Moor. So actually, yes, uh, the, the ruling class were, the, were, the, the, were, the, were Berbers. So in the chains of the Moor, meaning uh, we are under the under dominion of the of the Berbers and Zion bound to the cross. Of course, the cross stands for Christianity. That's so obvious. But uh, how wasn't wasn't um, hadn't in Islam conquered the Middle East after a few a century after Muhammad? Yes, I don't know what he's referring to. Zion bound to the cross here. Oh, so what? Okay. Okay, um, he lived during the first crusade and the crusaders had taken Jerusalem. So um, Jerusalem was under the crusaders. So it's Christians okay. at this point. Yeah. 
So it's really, uh, he's living under Muslim rule, the Holy Land is under Christian rule right now. What can I do and vow to and must? That, 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 what, what can I do? Can I do what I vow to and must? So he took a vow to go to, uh, to Israel, but how can he do it? How can he fulfill his vow? He'd rather give up all of, uh, of Spain for just a glimpse of Jerusalem's dust, okay? I, of course, like to improve this translation. And this is how I uh, translated it. My heart beats in the east. My heart beats in the east inside my breast, but I myself am captured in the farthest west. How can I enjoy my life, my drink, my food, when I must live in Islam's servitude? And bound with Christians chains and shackle, lies there the home of Zion's tabernacle. Can I fulfill what I so humbly swore, my vow to see Spain's riches nevermore? I cheer if all its wealth it would withhold, for Zion's waste I value more than gold. Yeah, I hope you like it. There's some uh, alliteration here. It's wealth it would withhold and Zion's waste, stuff like that. So I was pleased. Okay, now um, here's another one. Uh, and this is also about, uh, uh, about uh, Zion, but it's about the, the Israel who is not home and who is not um, uh, the home where... Um, Israel is the, is the bride, and, and God is the bridegroom, is the groom. And uh, it's been so long, the bride is waiting for the groom, but the groom has to pick up the bride. Again, I put in, in, um, in blue the, the rhyme, uh, the end rhyme, and you see, again, it's every other one except for the, the first one has also a rhyme in the middle. Yeah, this would be a good one to read, too. Okay. Um, your Israel the bride. Your bride comes out to you and yearns to see your face. Since when she was ejected from your holy sight, casts down her eyes in shame, for to your holy place she can't go up, while strangers do who have no right. She stands for you, though far removed, and bows towards your shrine, and every place she's held by gentle lords. For offering, she sends her words of supplication and lifts her heart and eyes towards your throne of light. Look down at her from heaven. Hear her invocation. She cries with bitter heart and with a soul, with a soul contrite. Contrite, right, yeah. Uh, contrite means remorseful, basically, yeah. Contrition, is it, have you heard of contrition? Doesn't matter. It's not that you don't need it when you go to uh, Home Depot or anything, but for poetry, it's a good word. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks so much. Is Christina here? Yes. Oh, hello, Christina. Um, we'll go to the next one. This is a, there's something called correspondence poem. So instead of writing, sending an email, or uh, uh, people wrote letters, but some people were really fancy, they wrote poems to their, uh, to their beloved. We already saw one correspondence poem. That was Dunash Ibn Labrat's wife, who wrote a poem to her husband who was on a, on a journey. So um, you can read this one. This is by Yehuda Levi, obviously. I thought neither of wealth nor the world, nor of losing all I accrued. Well, alone of my loins, only fruit, my soul's dearest and of her child, from whom parting still pierces my soul, my progeny and dear boy, his memory, my one joy. Can Yehuda forget Yehuda? Uh, so who is he talking about? His child. His grandson. So my... Um... It says, uh, it, um, my, soul's, uh, I, my soul's dearest, that is his daughter, and of her child. And the child is, uh, is then the boy. Um, so, and obviously, the boy was named after his grandfather. So he's Yehuda, and his grandson is also called uh, Yehuda. So can Yehuda forget Yehuda? That's fun, right? Um, it's beautiful, but uh, a bit sad. Now here have, on the ship, to the Holy Land. First, he had to uh, go to Egypt, by the way. But um, of course, uh, these were tiny boats and all very dangerous. And people, uh, it's not rare that people will just um, get shipwrecked and drown. On them. So uh, going overseas was, was actually seen as a, a, a life dangering uh, uh, thing. And there's still a, a prayer that people say after, uh, after they survive. Uh, uh, a, tr a trip over sea. Um, of course, now people even say it when they go, are in a, in, in a plane that goes over sea, but it's not at all comparable. 
um, this was really life dangerous and uh, traveling by plane is, seems to be one of the safest ways to go. But in any case, uh, it's become a custom. Um, Storm Tust is, is the name of the poem. Um, this is also a beautiful Andalusian meter. And so this is all the bunks, the whole idea that he, he rejected Andalusian meter because this is one of his very last poems in his life while he's already on his way to the Holy Land and he still writes in pure Arabic meter. So really uh, interesting. Um, yes, uh, Christina. I shout to God when my heart turns to slush, when my knees give away, when my gut is tight with fear, when oarsmen gape, when ropemen lose their grip, how else could I be? Just look at me, suspended on a boat between the wave and the water. I whirl and wander like a drunk, but what matter? In a while I whirl, more drunk than now, among your streets, Jerusalem. And when you think of whirling, you think of whirling dervishes. This is like a, an exercise that some dervishes, some mystics would do. They, they, they turn and they get into an ecstasy. So this is how he feels. But in Hebrew, uh, I whirl is a hog or a hog. And um, hog, a hog has to do with the Hebrew word hug. And hug is connected to the Arabic word hajj, which is a pilgrimage. And, uh, and the Hebrew word hug now in, nowadays is just used for holiday. So happy holiday, uh, they say hag sameach. But um, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, hug is only a pilgrimage uh, holiday. So there's only three, uh, uh, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, they're only called Hag. The others are not called Hag. In any case, it doesn't matter. It's all good. But um, he says, now I'm turning around. Because why is that the twirling? Why is that to do with Hag, with Hajj? Because uh, like in, the, in Islam, people make turns around the Kaaba one day, and on the seventh day of the holiday, seven times, the same in, Ju in, in Judaism, in the synagogue, on Sukkot on, on the day of uh, Booth, holiday festival of Booth, we, 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 we walk around um, <clears throat> the Torah one day and the seventh day, which is uh, seven times. And in, the, on the, in Jerusalem, they did it around the, the altar. So on, on a hug, you twirl, you make turns around the, the altar in the temple, basically. So all, all these words are connected to each other. Very interesting. So... Um, but he believes that he's going to be in the streets of Jerusalem more drunk. Drunk means in ecstasy. Because of spiritual ecstasy, he's going to be in the streets of Jerusalem. Um, yeah, that's what that was. On his way to the Holy Land, Yehuda Levi visited Egypt, where he received, received a warm welcome by large crowds and was hosted by dignitaries. They begged him to stay there forever. He could have been a celebrity his whole life. But no, his dream was to go to the Holy Land and feel close to God and be more spiritual. He stayed, though, in Egypt for a year. He, he was in Alexandria most of the time, and then he visited Cairo. Uh, his last poem that we have is a love poem that he wrote in Egypt. It goes like this, uh, in translation, of course. Wondrous is this land to see, with perfume its meadows laden. But fairer still than all to me is yon slender gentle maiden. Ah, time's swift flight, I fain would stay, forgetting that my locks are gray. So he is already older. He is in this uh, beautiful country. He enjoys the beautiful country, the side, countryside, all the fields. But then what he really enjoys is the sight of this young, beautiful girl. But then he thinks of himself, he looks in the mirror and he sees, I'm already an old man. What am I even thinking? Looking at this young girl, she just think oh, I'm a dirty old man. And that's the cruel fate of getting older. Yehud Alevi continued his journey in May 1141. The last thing we heard of him is that he reached the port of uh, Jaffa or Yafo in Hebrew. And then we don't hear from him anymore. He died that summer in the land of Israel, and it seems he never reached Jerusalem. There is a story told, which is hopefully not historic, not true, but the story is told that he was on his way to Jerusalem, approaching the city, looking up to his dream being fulfilled, and then an Arab horseman comes by with a sword and or a spear and spears him down. That was the 
That is the legend that, that is told about uh, Yehuda Halevi. Halevi, very dramatic. And I hope it's not true, but on the other hand, arriving in the Holy Land and dying of uh, malaria isn't fun either in any case. Let's not die. That's probably the best idea. Okay, so thank you for your attention. And, um, and uh, it's a pleasure teaching and it's fun and it's interesting. I hope for you too. Uh, at least I'm enjoying it. And uh, we'll continue next time with our next class.